Good evening and thank you. Um, thanks for joining us here at Portland State um, for an evening with world-renowned climate change activist, Kathy Jetnil Kitchener. Um, yay. <laughs> I've got some talking points to go over. Just keep me keep me in line here. Um, so my name is Kevin Thomas. I am a graduate student at PSU, working on a PhD in urban studies. I uh, also work for the Student Sustainability Center. And uh, thanks, shout out to Heather Spalding, who's our coordinator. She's here tonight. Um, part of my job there is to put on a series of events called Social Sustainability Month. So this event is part of Social Sustainability Month, which we started on, on uh, Monday and it's gonna run for four weeks. It's a series of events um, focusing on the intersection of environmental justice and social justice. So uh, Monday we had Indigenous Peoples Day celebration over at the Native American Center. And so we'll be having events for the next few weeks. Also, um, this is the beginning of Portland State of Mind, which is a 10-day series of events that the university puts on to promote activities on, on campus. And this is also a sustainability day. So there's three different, three different uh, reasons to be here. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so at Portland State, um, sustainability is infused into a lot of what we do. And uh, that's part of the mission of the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, which is an umbrella organization um, that the Student Sustainability Center is affiliated with and a lot of different sustainability uh, offices on campus. Um, they are uh, one of our host partners for tonight. And uh, people have come uh, from all across campus to work um, putting this event together. So we're gonna make sure to thank our partners for uh, that helped make this evening possible. Um, a couple of um, things I wanna announce. Um, there is an all gender bathroom out the door and to the right over by the flying elephant. Um, and I also want to thank our event co-sponsors, uh, Oregon Humanities, PSU Impact Entrepreneurs, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Speakers Board, all which contributed, uh, contributed valuable time and resources to help make this evening possible. And I'd also like to give a big thank you to Laura Gleim, who is the Communications Manager at the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, and uh, this evening would not have been possible without all of her hard work. And with that, okay, I got everything I need to say, good. Um, I'm going to introduce the person who has the honor of introducing Kathy. Uh, I have the honor of in introducing Dr. Alma Trinidad, who is on the faculty at PSU in the social work department. And uh, for those of you who don't know it, uh, about two months ago, Alma got her tenure letter. And so she's gonna be with us, yes. And that's a really, that's a really big deal. And um, we have a, a lot of names for Alma. Um, she does so many things on campus. Some people call her Dr. Alma. Some people are more formal, Dr. Trinidad. Um, Alma in some languages means soul. And so we can call her Dr. Soul too. <laughs> but she does an amazing amount of things on campus and uh, makes it possible for a lot of students to actually um, stay in school and finish because they see her as a role model. And we asked her to come introduce Kathy because we wanted to celebrate Alma too. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to 
Dr. Alma Trinidad. Thank you. Aloha kako. Kamusta kayo, amen? Welcome. Hello, good evening. Thank you, Kevin, for such a lovely introduction. Welcome, Kathy. Good evening, colleagues, students, and fellow community members. Welcome to this special event as we start the Portland State of Mind. It is my pleasure to be here. I am Dr. Alma Wansisuk Trinidad. I'm a professor and a faculty at the School of Social Work. My ancestors are from the Philippines. I grew up on the island of Molokai in Hawaii. My family was displaced on the, off the island due to the shutdown of the pineapple industry back in 1980s. Both my Filipino immigrant parents and grandfathers were laborers since the 1930s. My life partner, Hong Kam Wansisuk, who's up there, <laughs> was a refugee from Laos, and his family made Hawaii their home after the, the Vietnam War. It was my pineapple plantation lifestyle and upbringing on the island of Molokai, and the growing awareness of many of the indigenous, refugee, and immigrant populations on the islands that led to understanding the landscape and the foundation of learning of sustainability, inequalities, and social, social and environmental injustices. It was bearing witness to the many, many struggles of our island communities due to colonization and structural oppression that led me to the body of work that I have decided to embark as a scholar. Um, and through that journey, um, and being here at Portland State University for the last seven years, I've come to understand, I guess, my stance and my role as a P9, which means Filipina, scholar, warrior, and protector of aloha, which means love, radical love. Much like our honored speaker, keynote speaker, I've experienced as a youth in Hawaii um, deep internalized oppression. And like many of our Asian Pacific Islander um, Americans who attend our university and many of the universities here in the Pacific Northwest, um, we face very deep-rooted stereotypes. Um, for me, stereotypes of a Filipina in Hawaii um, and some of them, some of these stereotypes were being promiscuous and sexually active and getting pregnant before um, completing high school. Our young men were stereotyped as violent um, and being involved in gangs and eating dogs. We were teased for our very heavy accent, um, that it be in a public school or um, employment, employment or in positions of leadership. A lot of the statistics demonstrate that many Asian Pacific Islanders are not raving well. Despite all of that, um, and in the context of the melting pot of Hawaii, many of our communities rose, rose to the top, utilized our struggles, and rose above those struggles by building upon the wisdoms of our ancestors and learning about our genealogy and our collective stories of migration. Having recently visited my motherland of the Philippines and meeting my lost long family members and then being part of a um, human rights mission in Mindanao where I was able to build um, community and solidarity with the Filipino indigenous Luma communities I bear witness to what I've seen in Hawaii and many other Pacific Islander um, countries, the devastated impact of climate change and how it um, impacted many domains of our 
life. It is the legacies of colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism that threatens our livelihood. And despite that, it is through the arts and creative work via critical indigenous pedagogy of place, that's my scholarly work, many of our youth and our young adults find ways to heal, heal and be decolonized, decolonizing our minds, decolonizing our family, and most importantly, decolonizing our communities. It is through this venue that as minoritized communities, we have resisted, gained critical consciousness, and built and sustained a sense of community to speak our truth, elevate our stories, and most importantly, together with our allies and, our, and fellow change agents, recreate the world where our families and our com communities can rise. Before I turn the mic to our honored guests, I wanna share, inspired by your work, Kathy, um, a spoken word that I wrote earlier today to commemorate this event, this special occasion. Um, and it's entitled, Homage to Thy Motherland of the Philippines. E ala e, e ala e, rise, rise, stand firm. I am a Penai scholar warrior and protector of Kapu Aloha, Mahalaya, Ken Ayat. I, get, I got thy word of tenure and promotion to associate professor in a predominantly white institution of higher ed. Whoa, how the heck did I survive the treacherous canoe journey of change? I resisted every message that, I, that was told to me to sell my soul to the emperor. Holding on to the sacredness of knowledge, seeking and knowledge sharing to heal, empower, and transform. It was our ancestral spirits embodied in our relationships and building of communities that led to thy growing wisdom. Return to thy motherland to pay homage to thy ancestors, to praise and give thanks to such path. Smelling thy aroma, breathing the fresh air that hugs our, our rice paddies and bamboo fields. Being among lost, long family, each sharing a little of their stories, weaving into our collective narratives. The ancestors smiled and welcomed me home. Welcomed me home, home, home. Back home. Why did it take nearly four decades to return? I'm back, back here on these contentious, sometimes potent soils transformed, ready for another canoe journey of change, ready to pull up our rising communities of warriors of Aloha. I invite you to be part of that canoe journey of change. Now, I humbly would like to welcome our honored guest, Kathy, Kathy Gently Kijiner. She's a Marshallese writer. I heard her work recently, about, two, about a week ago, at the Pano event, but I viewed some of her work on YouTube and her writings, and I'm deeply inspired by her work. I feel like I know, I know her, and there's like a sisterhood, um, a sisterhood of collective struggles of our indigenous women and our indigenous families. Um, I'm very honored to be here with, with you. Um, Kathy um, has done a lot of work that focuses on trauma, trauma due to colonial, colonialism, racism, forced migration, and the legacy of American nuclear testing and the impeding threats of climate change. 
And being um, at the forefront of witnessing a lot of these um, events happening to her communities, she utilized um, creative work um, to empower her communities. And her most epic work, I think, was in front of the United Nations. Um, but her work, I think, in the community where she is the director of a youth organization um, is probably the most humbling work that I think she does. Um, so, welcome, Kathy. I hope that we may be inspired and moved and rise through our shared and collective journeys here. May her work and her words of wisdom inspire us. Thank you. Beautiful. Hello, can you guys hear me with this? Okay, great. So <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction, Alma. That was so beautiful to know your story, to feel a connection between our stories. And also, I did not expect to see an awesome poem and a, a show before my own performance. It's nice to be an audience member, can I just say? Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight uh, to listen to me speak. Um, on this issue and on these issues that are really close to my heart. Um, this is going to be kind of more of a talk story. This, that's a little bit more of my style. Uh, this is more like a journey. I'm going to be sharing my own personal journey with you all today. Uh, what I'm hoping is in sharing my personal journey, it can give you some form of reflection and it can give you a space to reflect on your own journey and how that has motivated your work and how that can motivate you to move forward and join movements and contribute to change within our own communities and within our, each of our own fights. Um, okay, so I think this is, can I, this screen is amazing. I'm just like, <laughs> I, I rocked in here and I was like, this is literally the biggest screen I've ever seen in my life. So I'm just getting used to it. Okay, so this is, um, the title of my presentation is Yip Jalbuk. Uh, poetry and Activism, uh, and I'm going to explain what Yip Jeldok means. Yip Jeldok is a Marshallese proverb, and it's a proverb that we say when a daughter is born. So when a girl is born, we say Yip Jeldok Adirine, which means you're fortunate to have a daughter. Um, the idea being that uh, it literally means a basket facing the speaker. So when a boy is born, we say Yip Jeldok, like the basket faces away. The reason why we have that is because uh, the basket facing the speaker um, is representative of, of our matrilineal culture. So land and lineage is passed down through our mothers rather than through our fathers. And I think this is really indicative of our society and it's an important part of who we are, that we're one of the few matrilineal societies surviving today. And I also just find it, it's just my most favorite phrase ever because I find it so beautiful that we are seen as something worthy just for being born, that we are this basket of offering towards our family. Um, and this is kind of another, it links also to what I'm gonna be discussing. Uh, so before I came here to this talk, I stopped at a Marshallese shop, a uh, Marshallese shop selling Marshallese handicrafts. They call them Amimono. This is called the Alefa store. So Marshallese handicrafts, can I just say, some of the best in the Pacific, you know. I mean, obviously I'm biased, but let's just be real. This is, this is amazing stuff. So this just kind of gives you some idea of what kinds of things we make. There's earrings, there's fans, there's mats, there's baskets, of course. And my favorite, I've always loved these ones, my favorite is the Yip Gege. Now Yip Gege is the basket that I brought with me today. And that's what this is right here. This is a Yip Gege. So a Yip Gege is like a basket that you would put uh, your sewing materials in. That's all, it's, that's all it was created for originally. Women had sewing materials. They said, oh, we need something to cover these. And they created these beautiful pieces of art. And if you look at it, it's so intricate. And it takes at least like a week to make. And it's just, uh, you know, it's just to store something as simple as sewing materials. And I watched this woman, and it just so happened that while I was there in the shop buying a basket, there was a woman inside who was weaving a basket, the same basket. And her name was Emrina Philip, and she's from the island that I'm from, Aur Atoll, right? So 
she was weaving and I asked her, you know, what are the names of the different materials? And I just kind of was just curious. And um, she started to break it down to me. And I realized that it's kind of a great metaphor for the different parts of who I am. So these are the different parts right here. The one at the top, the kimij, is uh, what stitches, it's thin, it's what stitches and binds the, two, the three pieces together. And it's from the new shoot of a coconut palm. The meloe is the midrib of the coconut, and it's the thick structure, the fiber. The mang is uh, pandanus leaves that's been pounded, beaten, and cooked, and then it's a little bit softer, and it wraps around the meloe. So I'm sharing this with you because I think this is kind of a, I'm using this as a grounding. I'm gonna use this as a grounding for our conversation today for the different parts that represent who I am. And in my sharing of the story, I'm hoping that we can talk further about the different parts that make up who we are. So let me start with the Malloway. The Malloway is the thick structure of the basket, right? That provides the, uh, the roots of the basket. It helps, helps it stand up, right? It's the core. And so for me, the Malloway represents my culture, my island, my family. And this is something that has always inspired who I am, and it's always motivated and informed the writing, my own writing. So Marshall Islands, where the heck is Marshall Islands? Who the heck are the Marshallese people? The Marshall Islands is located in the Northern Pacific region. So we are not South Pacific. You see Moana, that's got nothing to do with us. Moana is South Pacific Islanders. We are North Pacific, a little bit lesser known, in the area called Micronesia. Our people came to our islands thousands, thousands and thousands of years ago. And we were canoe navigators, some of the best canoe navigators in the world. Uh, we were weavers, we were fishermen, we were fisherwomen, uh, we were storytellers, chanters, you know, and um, we were, of course, mothers, husbands, daughters, wives, all of those. Uh, our culture, after a period of just, you know, we were some of the last culture to actually be colonized. But uh, the areas of colonization began with the Spanish, then the Germans, the Germans had a more significant era of colonization, and then the Japanese. Um, it was under the era of colonization under the Japanese that we were entered into uh, World War II. But first, sorry, backtrack. Uh, under the German era, that was when actually our great-grandfather came over from, uh, well, through Australia, from Germany. And so that's also within my legacy, within me. Within me, we, each of us carry histories of colonization, histories of, you know, histories and legacies of exchange and travel. And this is my legacy. My great-grandfather is the one with the glasses. His name is Karl Heine. He came as a trader and then stayed on as a missionary, as a Protestant missionary. And that's my grandfather over here, born Heine, up here in the middle, right? Is there a laser? There's a, there's a laser. Oh, there you go. There you go. Born Heine, right? So anyways, we, under the Japanese occupation, we became, uh, we got entered into World War II. So not many people know, but the uh, Pearl Harbor bombing those bombs actually were launched off of Wache Atoll in the Marshall Islands. But of course, the Marshallese people had no say in this. We had no idea about this involvement at all. Um, I think I've, I've read accounts of uh, Marshallese people like noticing a bunch of Japanese people celebrating, and they're like, oh, we don't know why they're so happy, but you know, this is great, woohoo. They had no idea they just were entered into World War II. Okay, so World War II was the bloodiest, worst hist part of Micronesian history ever, and I'm just learning about it now. Soon after World War II, the Americans came and liberated us from the Japanese, heavy quotation on the liberation. And then uh, we were entered into a legacy of nuclear testing. Now this is another important aspect of our history. So these are Bikini Islanders being moved from their island to, so that they could begin the nuclear testing on the atoll. Now Bikini Atoll is actually what inspired the bikini. So I know I've heard people say stuff like, oh, Bikini Atoll, that's like named after the bikini. That's so funny. I'm like, no, actually, that's named after our island. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the bikini was first invented by a French designer who said, who was inspired by the nuclear testing because he thought it had an explosive effect on men, the bikini. Yes. 
Yikes, yes, ah, oh, man, we can dig deep with that kind of twisted sense of you know, history. But either way, the Bikini Islanders were moved off of their island to Kule Island, which is much, 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 much smaller and much more poor resource poor. And the US began to test over 60 weapons, 60 nuclear weapons, uh, the biggest legacy of nuclear testing in the world, largest, definitely. This is the Operation Bravo. This is the bomb that was detonated on our island that was at least 100 times more powerful than the bomb that was detonated in Hiroshima. This bomb uh, contributed, had actually a horrible effect because it was so large that the ash, the radiation ash that fell down from the bomb got swept up into trade winds and flew to islands that were nearby where people were actually living. And so people, the kids over there started eating it. They thought it was snow. They were playing in it and then everyone got sick. Their skin started to burn. So besides the radiation ash, we experienced some of the highest levels of nuclear, of uh, cancers in the world. Um, our women had to deal with birth defects, something called jelly babies, literally babies born with no bones. They had miscarriages. Some of the most traumatic parts of the nuclear testing, I would say, was what women had to experience in their own bodies in, through giving birth. Um, and besides that, uh, they have never been able to return to these islands. Some of our islands were literally incinerated, wiped off the map. And um, it's been 70 years, Last this year marks 70 years since Bikini Islanders have been able to return to their island. Um, so, and also, we have not been given proper compensation. The U.S. technically still owes us $2 billion for in damages and in loss of life, loss of health, loss of land, everything. So, um, the first poll I'm going to perform for you, History Project, is all about that legacy. And afterwards, I'll discuss a little bit about why I wanted to include this poem in a discussion on climate change. I'm pretty sure you guys can make, you guys look smart. I'm pretty sure you guys can make that link on your own, but um, this can at least give you something to think about. Um, so this poem I wrote while I was in college, in Mills College in Oakland, California. Um, and I wrote it because I was pretty tired of explaining to everybody what the heck the Marshall Islands is and what, uh, you know, what this nuclear testing is. I was like, we know your history. How come you don't know our history? What the heck? But I mean, I don't blame everybody. You know, people are still learning. I'm still learning a lot too. So this is a piece that basically sums it up and it's inspired by a history project that I did when I was 15 years old. So I'll go ahead and perform that piece now. <coughs> Excuse me. At 15, I decided to do my history project on nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Time to learn my history, I decide. I weave through book after article after website, all on how the US once used my island home for nuclear testing. I sift through political jargon, tables of nuclear weapons with names like Operation Bravo, Crossroads, and Ivy, quotes from generals like, 90,000 people are out there. Who cares? I'm not mad at all, really. I already knew all of this. I glance at a photograph of a boy, peeled skin, arms, legs suspended, a puppet, next to a lab coat lost in his clipboard. I read firsthand accounts of what we call jelly babies, tiny beings with no bones, skin, red tomatoes, the miscarriages gone, unspoken, the broken translations. I never told my husband. I thought it was my fault. I thought there must be something wrong inside of me. I flip through snapshots of American Marines and nurses branded white with bloated grins, sucking beers and tossing beach balls along our shores. And my Islander ancestors, cross-legged before a general, listening to his fairy tale about how it's for the good of mankind to hand over our islands, let them blast radioactive energy into lazy-limbed coconut trees, into sagging bird fruit trees, into busy fishes that sparkle like new sun into coral reefs, brilliant as an aurora borealis woven beneath a glassy sea. God will thank you, they told us. Yeah, as if God himself ordained those powdered flakes to drift onto our skin, our hair, our eyes to seep into our bones. We mistook radioactive fallout for snow. God will thank you, they told us, as if God's just been waiting for my people to vomit, vomit, vomit all of humanity's sins onto impeccable white shores gleaming like the cross burned into open, scarred.
pawns. At one point in my research, I stumbled along a photograph of goats tied to American ships, bored and munching on tubs of grass. At the bottom, a caption read, goats and pigs were left on naval ships as test subjects. Thousands of letters flew in from America protesting animal abuse. At 15, I want megatons of TNT, radioactive energy in a fancy degree, anything and everything I could ever need to send ripples of death through a people who put goats before human beings so their skin can shrivel beneath the glare of hospital room lights three generations later as they watch their grandmother, their mother, their auntie's life drip across that same black screen, knots of knuckles tied to steel beds, cold and absent of any breath. But I'm only, I'm only 15. <laughs> So I finished my project. Graph my people's death by cancer on flowcharts in 3D. Glue stick my ancestors' voice onto a poster board I bought from Office Max. Staple tables screaming the millions of dollars they stuffed into our mouths generation after generation after generation. And the top I spray painted in bold stencils Dell for the good of mankind. And I entered it into a school district-wide competition called History Day. My parents were proud, and so was my teacher. And when the three balding white judges finally came around to my project, one of them looked at it and said, yeah, but it wasn't really for the good of mankind though, was it? And I lost. Thank you. So I always kind of had to add the thank you afterwards because people are always like, wait, that's it? <laughs> it ends like that? Yes, it ends like that. I, I make it purposeful that I end with just me losing the project because to me, it's a metaphor for where our people are today. We still have not seen justice. We have been losing and we're still losing. The, you know, our country has just placed or filed a lawsuit against a number of different countries for violating the non-proliferation treaty and still having nuclear weapons in their country. That case was thrown out last week by the International Court of Justice. And they said, you have no grounds for this, you know, because you have no actual, what was it, uh, conflict with these specific countries. But the thing is, we do, because we are a legacy of people who have experienced nuclear testing, have lost our homes to it, and we understand how it has affected, uh, we, under we felt it firsthand, basically, right? And so the way I link this to climate change is that we've already been displaced because of a larger country's motivations, because of a larger country deciding that this group of people doesn't matter. They decide they chose our island because it's far away from other people, but they didn't take into account the people who are actually living there, right? And I think this is where environmental injustice and legacies and institutions of racism, all of that linked together, legacies of racism and colonialism, it's all linked. It's all about deciding who matters and who doesn't. And this is, again, the issue we're dealing with with climate change. So the reason why I began to start fighting for climate change is I, I graduated from college and I went back to Medjuro. This is my home in the Marshall Islands. Does it look big? No. <laughs> It's very thin, yes, it's very thin. It takes about an hour to get from one end to another. There are some parts of the island where you are literally, there's ocean on either side of you. The ocean is enormous. And you just cannot see that until you go home, until you come here to this island and see what it's like firsthand. And so this is what, it was, this is what I came home to. And that's when I realized, wow, we're really vulnerable. This is real. I'd heard about climate change before, but I was like, no, this is something distant. But this is very much real. And, um, and then the floodings began to happen. Huge amounts of water crashing into our homes. And it was happening so much more often than it had ever happened before. Uh, flooding in our streets. You know, again, more waves just crashing against our homes. I mean, you have to remember, there's no separation between our houses and the ocean. We're right on the edge. There's nowhere, you can't move more inland. You can't be like, well, why don't you go to the mountains and go a little bit higher? There is nowhere higher, people. <laughs> the highest place is a bridge. Is this one bridge? And I got to say, it's really not that high. <laughs> Kids jump off of it as like a dare. Like that's how serious it is. So there's nowhere else we can go. 
And then even our graves are washing out into the sea. It's affecting even our dead. This is what I'm trying to say, yeah. I can see my cousin. I'm just telling him to come in. It's okay. Yeah, so it's even affecting our, our past, you know. Our, our dead are washing out to sea. And this is how much it's affecting all of us. This is my cousin's house. This is literally my cousin's house. She lived here for her whole entire life, and the whole thing got crashed into by waves and in the middle of her sleeping. She woke up to the water crashing into her house, and they had to leave immediately. And so she had to spend the past two years uh, taking out loans, uh, dealing with building you know, requirements, uh, applying for, for, for all of these different kinds of things just so that she could rebuild a new house. And her family was struggling enough as it is, but this just adds more to it. You know, you remember, you know, remember we're, a, we're considered a third world country, not a great terminology, but that's what we're considered. So already we're dealing with tough issues, but to add climate change on top of it is just, is too much. Drought also. So besides water, we have extremes of water and then we have extremes of drought. This past couple months was the worst drought we'd ever seen. And drought is such a weird type of issue. It's like slow burning. You don't really realize it's there. It doesn't slap you across the face the way water does until you're thirsty, until you're really, really thirsty. And there are people literally fighting each other for water. So climate change is something that, you know, I started to wonder about. And so I began to do research into it. And the thing that bothered me the most about what people write about with climate change, whenever they discuss the Marshall Islands, we're discussed, we're talked about, we're talked around, we're talked at. But we're never quoted, we're never given a voice, given a space. And the worst part is that they always assume that we're just going to have to leave, that there's nothing that we can do. It's always like, well, where are they going to go? You know, uh, are they going to have a seat at the UN? Will they still have passports? Well, who are these people be? They even like compare us to like Atlantis. I'm like, man, don't compare us to Atlantis. <laughs> so again, I was brought back to the basket. Okay, the basket is a source of information, of inspiration. Information, inspiration. Um, one night I was with my family and we went to go stay into my Auntie Mary. And it was really beautiful. It was all women, like a huge room full of just women singing, harmonizing to a woman that was, uh, you know, she had a Alzheimer's. She couldn't even remember who we were or who she was. And I thought this is something I would want my friends to know about. And then I started thinking, what if I sent them a, a package and just told them the things that I would want them to know? I would want them to know about the islands. I would want them to know about these things. So that's what inspired the next piece. It's called Tell Them. <clears throat> I prepared the package for my friends in the States. First, the dangling earrings, woven into half moons, black pearls glinting like an eye in a storm of tight spirals. Second, the baskets. Sturdy, also woven, brown, cowrie shells shiny, intricate mandalas shaped by calloused fingers. Inside the basket, I write a message. Wear these earrings to parties, to classes and meetings, to the corner store, the grocery store, and while riding the bus. Store jewelry, incense, copper coins, and curling letters like this one in this basket. And when others ask you where you got this, you tell them they're from the Marshall Islands. Show them where it is on a map. Tell them we are a proud people toasted dark brown as the carved ribs of a tree stone. Tell them we are descendants of the finest navigators in the world. Tell them our islands were dropped from a basket carried by a giant. Tell them we are the hollow hulls of canoes as fast as the wind slicing through the Pacific Sea. We are wood shavings and drying pandanus leaves and sticky buiros at Cayman's. Tell them we are the sweet harmonies of mothers, aunties, sisters. Songs late into night, tell them we are whispered prayers. The breath of God, a crown of fuchsia flowers encircling Auntie Mere's white seafoam hair. Tell them we are styrofoam cups of Kool-Aid red, waiting patiently for the homage. We are papaya golden sunsets bleeding into a glittering open sea. Tell them we are dusty rubber slippers swiped from concrete doorsteps. We are the ripped seams and the broken door handles of taxis. We are sweaty hands shaking another sweaty hand in heat. Tell them we are little girls with braids cartwheeling beneath the rain. We are shards of broken beer bottles burrowed beneath fine white sand. We are children flinging like rubber bands across the road clogged with chugging cars. Tell them we only got one road. 
And after all this, tell them about the water, how we have seen it rising, flooding across our cemeteries, gushing over our sea walls, and crashing against our homes. Tell them what it's like to see the entire ocean level with the land. Tell them we are afraid. Tell them we don't know of the politics or the science, but we see what's in our own backyard. Tell them some of us are old fishermen who believe that God made us a promise. Tell them some of us are a little bit more skeptical. But most importantly, you tell them that we don't want to leave, that we've never wanted to leave, and that we are nothing without our islands. Thank you. So I kind of sneaked, accidentally sneaked ahead a little bit. But basically, that poem, I put it out on YouTube, uh, mostly because I'm not really sure what inspired me to do that. I just thought, I want people to hear this. I don't know if that's some kind of crazy e egomaniac type of deal. I'm not sure where I got the inspiration to do it. But I put it out on YouTube, and it got people kind of noticing the work that I do. And around this time, I showed this picture already, my life changed. I had my first daughter. Mata Fele Benham Kathy Makirusa. Yeah, I know, she's adorable. I just love throwing this picture up. I'm like, come on, revel in her glory. Yes, she is super gorgeous, yes. So she, as the cliche goes, life changes completely, entirely, when you have a daughter, when you have a child. Suddenly, everything becomes more immediate. Suddenly, you need to be more on top of your thing. You need to figure out when to feed her, but also write, but also do this. It's crazy. Um, Anyways, so I had my daughter, and I finished my master's, um, and then I went back home to begin teaching at the College of the Marshall Islands. And during this time, the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the Marshall Islands contacts me, because he saw my video, tell them, and asks if I'd like to be a part of a U.N. summit, to be a part of it, if he could nominate me. I was like, okay, sure, that's fine, that's fine. And then... Um, I got an email saying, out of 500 candidates, we've narrowed it down to 50. You're one of the 50. Send us a video showing us why you, know, you should be chosen. And I kind of was like, I didn't know it was this competitive. OK, all right. So I sent a video. And then I got a call saying, OK, you're one of four people that will definitely speak at this summit. And I was like, cool. And then they got a call the next day. You're the person opening this summit. You're speaking in front of hundreds of world leaders. You're following Leonardo DiCaprio. We need you to write a new piece. Yes, it was crazy. So it was crazy. <laughs> it was basically really crazy. Um, so like. You know, picture me, I'm a new mom, I'm a new teacher, I'm teaching like 80 students, I'm breastfeeding at night, and then they tell me I have to write a completely new poem that will save the world. <laughs> they literally said that. They literally said, we need you to write a poem that will save the world. Like, that's super easy. Um, and they, <laughs> they asked me to, to write the poem to direct it to a movement, to direct it towards the, the climate change movement and to direct it towards leaders. I didn't know how to do that. I was like, I don't even know anything about this movement. So I asked them to send me all of these images, whatever they could about the climate change movement. And that's when I saw, what I saw was really beautiful. It actually really moved me that there's thousands of people all over the world that are trying to do what they can to save our, our world. And I thought, well, I don't know how to talk to you know these world leaders. I don't know how to talk to a movement. But I just was a mom. I mean, maybe I can talk to my daughter. I can tell her what I would want her to know when she grows up about how hard we're fighting for her generation, for this world, for her world, for our islands. And so that's what came up here. And so uh, this is a poem that they created. Uh, this, and they created a video to go alongside it. So this is a poem for her. Oh, and a quick note. The title of the piece is Dear Mata Felipeinam. Mata Felipeinam is actually her first and middle name. Matafele is the village that uh, it's, uh, her family comes from, from her father's side, because they're from Samoa. My partner is Samoan. And Bainam is the land that my family comes from. Um, I made sure that we have both of these names in this piece, because it's an homage to the land and our ancestry, and these lands that could be lost if we don't fight. So I'm going to have to do this. Okay, hold on just a second. 
Okay. Dear Mata Filipino, you are a seven month old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg and bald as the Buddha. Your thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Mata Filipino, I want to tell you about that lagoon. That lucid, sleepy lagoon lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of sea walls, and crunch through your islands shattered bones. They say you, your daughter, and your granddaughter too will wander, rootless, with only a passport to call home. Dear Mata Felipe, don't cry. Mommy promises you, no one will come and devour you. No greedy whale of a company sharking through political seas, no backwater bullying of businesses with broken morals, no Blindfolded bureaucracy gonna push this mother ocean over the edge. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. No one's losing their homeland. No one's gonna become a climate change refugee, or should I say no one else? To the Carteret Islanders of Papua New Guinea and to the Taro Islanders of the Solomon Islands, I take this moment to apologize to you. We are drawing the line here because we, baby, are going to fight. Your mommy, daddy, boo-boo, Jimma, your country, and your president too, we will all fight. And even though there are those hidden behind platinum titles who like to pretend that we don't exist, who like to pretend that the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Maldives, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, the floods of Algeria, Colombia, Pakistan, and all the earthquakes and hurricanes and tidal waves didn't exist, still, there are those who see us. Hands reaching out, fists raising up, banners unfurling, megaphones booming, and we are canoes blocking coal ships. We are the radiance of solar villages. We are the fresh, clean soil of the farmer's past. We are petitions blooming from teenage fingertips. We are families biking, recycling, reusing, engineers dreaming, designing, building, artists painting, dancing, writing, and we are spreading the word. And there are thousands out on the street, marching hand in hand, chanting for change now. And they're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us. Because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Dear Mata Filipino, you are eyes heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes and sleep in peace. Because we won't let you down. You'll see. Thank you. So that's a picture to show that I did it. Yeah, <laughs> that I was actually at the UN. And can I just say the UN is a little bit like, you know, a little bit like, Get over yourselves, UN. I'm just saying. <laughs> Big emblem on the wall. I was like, can you get any bigger, UN? OK, all right. But either way, it turned out OK. You know, baby came on stage. I mean, talk about a family photo, right? Family photo opportunity. Um, and it was really interesting because it changed the entire atmosphere of the room after I did that poem. All of a sudden, all these diplomats and politicians were coming up to me and asking to hold my baby. And <laughs> Yeah, I was like, all right, sure, yeah, yeah, you can hold it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, telling me about their children and just telling me about people who they cared about. And it changed it entirely into uh, a warmer place. And that's where I see poetry and art being so effective. Um, you know, it can't exist without science, obviously, without politics, without some type of work, but art can contribute something entirely different, and it shows the human face to these issues. So after I perform this, uh, we can move on to Kimi Dinao, the third aspect of my work, activism. So this is something that I'm really new at. That's why this is actually fitting. If you guys remember from the beginning, the Kimi is the white, the thin white stitching that keeps these together. The thin white stitching that keeps these together, and it's from the new shoot of the coconut palm, which is very fitting for my role in activism, which is very new. 
I'm very, very new to this thing, so I don't really know exactly what I'm doing. But I'm kind of making it up as I go along, and you know, I'm just trying to get inspiration and learn as I go along in this journey. So what I did was I had this platform all of a sudden. And um, I thought, well, what the heck can I do with this? So we started this organization. We had this organization already, but we really dug in this time. And it's called Jojigum. Uh, Jojigum is an acronym for the longer title, which is Jaruruvin Jibang Eneo Egudug Maruru. That's the full title of it. No, quite a mouthful. Um, but it means Youth for a Greener Marshall Islands. And Jojigum also means your home. So it's an idea that we wanted to create an organization that targets youth, the biggest population in the Marshall Islands, and targets environmentalism. Because so far, there's no organization that targets these two areas. Um, so like I said before, uh, I, start, I mean, I didn't say this before, but I started the organization with my cousin. And this is my cousin, oops, this is my cousin here uh, protesting, and this is around the same time that I was at the UN performing, she was in Australia participating in an action where they used, uh, a bunch of Pacific Islanders came together and used canoes to block a coal ship. So that line in that poem, we are canoes blocking coal ship, was an homage to, the, to that action because I knew that was about to happen. And so it kind of gave her a platform, not just me as well. So we suddenly had this platform and connections and so, yeah, so this is a great photo of her also wearing uh, a jagir. So I'm gonna come back to this jagir in a second, but, and cause I'm wearing, that's what I'm wearing right now. That's a, a mat, a traditional clothing mat that we used to wear. I'm gonna come back to that. But, so either way, we had this awareness, we had this platform, we had this foot in the door in these climate change discussions. And we thought, what do we wanna do with it? Well, there's a lot that we did with it, but I'm gonna focus on one specific action. And the action we did was leading up to Paris COP21. Now, this was this past November when they had uh, COP21 was a conference of the parties, which was a conference on climate change every year worldwide. And leading up to this was a lot of meetings between different groups on like, because this was supposed to be a historic conference. And when, we were, when I was a part of those meetings, that's when I was really exposed to this activist movement that unfortunately, well, to me, unfortunately, was predominantly white. And this was a problem for me as an indigenous coming in because I felt as if my voice didn't matter. And it felt as if our, my needs didn't matter and our island's needs didn't matter. Case in point, two degrees. So two degrees is the degrees that we're aiming for, uh, that was, they were aiming for. So let's say the global temperature right now is rising. And they're saying if it reaches two, higher than two degrees, then full blown catastrophe is gonna hit. So what scientists and politicians and organizers were saying was, okay, let's make sure that we put it at a cap at two degrees and get all of these countries to agree to limit their warming to two degrees. The thing is, actually, according to scientists, at 1.5 is actually much better for low-lying atolls. At two degrees, low-lying atolls and other nations are underwater. So there was this weird disparity where I was in these rooms full of climate organizers, like-minded people like myself, who kept throwing around the two degrees like that was the target. And I was sitting there like, wait, you know that two degrees is bad for my country. Why are you, why? I don't understand why we're not changing this terminology. So I approached one of them and they said, well, it's just a, it's just a benchmark for climate negotiations. We just need it up there, but don't worry, it'll fall much lower than two degrees. And I was like, how can you know that? How can you guarantee that? How can you gamble with our islands like that? So that's what we decided. We joined the campaign 1.5 to stay alive and we figured this is the target goal. That's what we want in the treaty amongst other things. Um, so we started a campaign, social media campaign, and we asked uh, Marshallese all over the world to share photos of themselves with 1.5 to stay alive. Might not be that big of a deal to you, but this was the first time I'd ever seen Marshallese youth on a large scale participating in something bigger than themselves. And it was really inspiring. So many photos just flooding in of these youth who wanted to take part in this conversation. They were hungry. They were hungry to be a part of this conversation. And that's what was so inspiring to me. So this next piece I'm gonna do is called Two Degrees. Um, I'm gonna try to, let me check the time and see where we're at so I don't take too much time. Uh, okay, all right, so we're good. Um, so I only have two pieces left after this piece. I mean, two pieces, this piece and another piece. So this piece is called Two Degrees. 
Um, yeah, so this is a piece that I wrote for CNN. A CNN reporter was doing a series on two degrees and he asked me to write a poem. So I said, okay, sure. And I said, would it be okay if I wrote a 1.5 degree poem instead, instead of it's about two degrees? And he said, yeah, sure. So this is the piece that I wrote. <clears throat> the other night, my one-year-old was a fever pressed against my chest. Together, we wrestled with a thermometer that read 99.8 degrees. The doctor says technically 100.4 is a fever, but I can see her flushed face, how she drapes across my lap listless. Nabinim is usually a wobbly walking toddler, all chunks and duck-footed shaky knees, stomping squeaky yellow light-up shoes across the edge of the reef. And I think what a difference a few degrees can make. Scientists say if humans warm the world more than two degrees, then catastrophe will hit. Imagine North American wildfires increasing by 400%, animal extinction rising by 30%, freshwater declining by 20%, thousands, millions left wandering, wondering what happened. At a climate change conference, a colleague tells me two degrees is just a benchmark for climate negotiations. I tell him two degrees is a gamble. At two degrees, my island is underwater. This is why our leaders push for 1.5. Seems small, like 0.5 degrees shouldn't matter. Like 0.5 degrees are just crumbs, like the Marshall Islands must look on a map, just crumbs you dust off the table, wipe your hands clean of. Today, Libinum is feeling better. She bobs around her backyard, drops pebbles and leaves into a plastic bucket before emptying it out and putting them back in again. As I watched her, I think about futility. I think about the world making the same mistakes again and again. Since the Industrial Revolution, since 1977, when a scientist said two degrees was just an estimate. On Kile Island, the tides were underestimated. Patients with a nuclear history threaded into their bloodlines, woke to a wild water world, a rushing rapid of salt, a sewage of syringe and gauze. Later, they wheeled their hospital beds out, let them rest in the sun. They must be stained, rusted, our people creaking brackish from salt spray and nuclear radiation blasts. So, so tired, wondering if the world will dust us off the table. Will they dust their hands of us, wheel us out to rest in the sun, wipe them clean? My father tells me Idik, the Marshallese word for when the tide is nearest in equilibrium, is the best time for fishing. Maybe that's what I'm doing. Fishing for recognition, riding the tide towards an equilibrium, willing the world to find its balance. So that people remember that beyond the discussions, beyond the statistics and the numbers, there are faces all the way out here. There is a toddler stomping squeaky yellow light-up shoes across the edge of a reef, not yet underwater. Thank you. So this is the last part of my discussion. I give it to you guys, man. I generally don't like to talk this long, to be completely honest. I am, <laughs> I don't usually like to hear myself talk for long periods of time, but I just wanted to make sure I, I got it all in. And this is the last part of my talk. Now, it's about diaspora. And um, it's a la the last piece I'm gonna talk about is kind of a little bit more complicated. And it's something that I've been kind of uh, meditating over, is what does it mean to be from the diaspora? The mang, as you guys rem might remember, is the thin pandanus leaf that wraps around the meloe, right? Meloe, the mang is, the meloe, the mang is pandanus leaf that's been beaten, and you wrap it, wrap, wrap it, wrap it around the meloe. And to me, when I was watching the woman who was weaving, Amrina, weaving the, the basket, it kept breaking the whole time. It's so thin. Um, and I think that's very representative of this diasporic experience. So for those who don't know, diaspora is a term that we use for people who are living away from their homelands. And the thing is, I lived away for a while. This is me at my graduation in Hawaii, uh, in Hawaii, when I was, uh, I graduated from high school. This is me and my mom. And um, I lived there for 16 years, and I lived there for two years, uh, in the Marshalls for two years, and it, it just, you know, there's a disconnect that you feel uh, when you're living so far away from home. And this is something that was always a bit of a shame, something, a, a source of shame for me. It's not understanding these roots, not necessarily knowing all of the language that I needed to know. 
But only recently have I come to realize that there, while there are definitely some drawbacks of being a part of the diaspora, there are also important parts of it. I wouldn't have poetry. I wouldn't have this spoken word artistry. I wouldn't be able to speak to you in a way that is so fluid and understandable and accessible to you had I not had this experience in the diaspora. But on the other hand, on the other hand, being away from home for so long and going back and seeing how big the ocean is and how vulnerable it is, it's like, you know, when you're living it somewhere, everything just gets normalized after a while. Me having the outsider experience kind of ignited in me that the awareness that this is something really serious that we needed to take seriously. So another part of the diaspora that I would say links to all of this is that I know the pain of losing your culture and losing your language. I know that pain, but this is something that happened, you know, me moving away was sort of a choice. If we don't do something about climate change, thousands of Marshallese people, there's over 60,000 Marshallese people right now, will not have that choice. They will lose that pain, they will feel that pain a hundredfold because they, do not, they don't have a choice in the matter. And that's why this is something that I, that contributes to this conversation just as much. Besides this, um, it's this feeling like you, you know, you're a part of, uh, that you're a representative of your culture everywhere you go. And it's very weird to be kind of objectified in a certain way, to be told, okay, come here, speak your poetry, now sit down, oh, great. You know, it, in a sense, you become a little bit objectified. You become uh, burdened with representation. And so I really began to think about all of this, the next poem, when I, we had our first climate change arts camp. So this is the last quick little video I'm gonna show you before I perform my last piece. And this is a video, a poem, I mean a video. This is a video uh, that shows a camp that our organization put together this past couple months. And it's one, only one week, but we taught uh, workshops on climate change, and it was all to inspire our youth to create artwork and poetry on climate change. So I'm gonna maybe uh, talk a little bit over the video, but I just wanted to show you a quick clip of it. So our, one of our instructors created this video. Um, there's no dialogue, so I can talk over it, but um, she took this video right outside of her house. This is literally outside in the marshals. This is what it looks like. It's pretty. Pretty, <laughs> right? If I do say so myself. So, yeah, so through US Embassy, we focused on working with 30 high school students. And um, basically, I kind of felt like I was tired of always me being the one speaking out about this issue. And I wanted to figure out a way to get Marshallese youth to put their stories out there. So, we brought them together. This is a, a clip of them at the dump site at our uh, dump site on the island. If you notice, it's crazy. It's huge amounts of waste, right? So we are guilty of the waste too. So what we wanted to do was create a connection between waste and climate change, right? So this is them. We brought them to the dump site and we had them kind of just take it all in, learn about the things they did. We brought other poets. Uh, this is my mentor performing. And so they would be the ones really giving them, teaching the workshops. Uh, this is another clip. This is a, a shot of the seawall that was broken outside of the outside of the dump site. So again, waste and climate change links. We had presentations on coral bleaching, also how coral bleaching is linked to climate change, and also weaving. How our weaving tradition is getting affected by climate change. And then they also went snorkeling so that they could actually see the coral reefs that were bleached and all the coral, also the corals that weren't bleached. And then they wrote about it. They wrote about it and they drew about it. And then they shared it, we shared it with our community. So these are the murals, you can see some of them. They were amazing. They did this so quickly and they did it on their own. And they also performed their poetry too. And they used like materials to actually, like actual pieces of trash on the murals. So these murals are now in our Capitol building. 
So you can see they show links to our culture, they show their fear, that's the Capitol building underwater. It expressed their deep fear. It's a fish with trash in between his belly. Quick shot of all of them. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a cool clip right there. I love that video. So, all this to say that it was during this workshop that I became again inspired. And this is the last piece that I want to share with you. Um, and it, it's really about this burden of representation, but also this fear that's a part of who we all, all are. So this is a mural that one of the students painted, and it's crazy when it's really, really big and you can see it in real life. And they said it, it represents, you know, the scars represent, uh, the scar on the side represents the nuclear legacy and the tears, you know, this is the islands, all of the islands in the stick charts coming down as she cries for her islands. But she's still beautiful, and they're saying that she'll heal and the idea is that our islands will heal, and it's their hope for our islands, despite all the trauma that our country has gone through. And so what me and my friend did, she's a face painter. She did this face painting, and um, we put the paint together where we were basically inspired by their artwork, and we created this face paint. Um, and then this is a piece that I wrote uh, all about it. So this is a new piece. <clears throat> and it's a bit more layered than the other pieces, just as a warning. I am a mouthful of glass marbles, a rolled tongue stuck raw in my clogged throat, white man's burden boiled syrup sweet, slowing down my speech. When I was six, I moved to Hawaii, learned my name was no longer Tute, it was Kathy, I became blacktop negotiations, tetherball tied tongues, a new culture to learn. When I was 22, I moved back to Medero, a small strip of land, an ocean of knowledge I no longer knew, a sea of blank spaces, a place that was no longer home. When I was 24, another Micronesian told me that girls like me are westernized, Americanized, therefore lost. I stood and watched my cousin tattoo a stink chart, stick chart into her back, the buzz of ink, a map to find our way back home. When I was 26, I saw my last name spelled proper, just how it sounds, for the first time. I realized I've been shaping it wrong all these years for colonial ears to hear. Jetnell Kitchener, how do you say your name? How do you say your country? Where is your country? Show it to me, dance for me, hang on the wall for me. I'm a burden of representation. I am boxed in at the Bishop Museum, an indigenous voice woven for your display. Here you go, step right up. Listen to this poet, listen to this native tongue. Look, she walks and she talks too. But before I was a label, verifying contents, before I was a glass cage, before the water creeped up to our shores, before I learned not to trust that tide, before I was confronted with roots braided into a plastic umbilical attached to a mountain of trash that's consumed our, our, our home, before I was just four years old, I was crouched slippers on the dirt path outside my home, shooting marbles watching this world through a sea glass glow. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Again, I just want to honor our hosts, hosts and sponsors, the Institute for Sustainable S Solutions, the Student Sustainability Center, Impact Entrepreneurs, Oregon Humanities and Portland State College and Liberal Arts and Sciences. Mahalo, thank you. Have a great evening. Drive safely.